Hi, this is Allison Sheridan of the No Silicast Podcast, hosted at podfeed.com, a technology geek podcast with an ever so slight Apple bias. Today is Wednesday, September 20th, 2023, and this is show number 959. Well, since the show is coming out super early on a Wednesday, this is your big hint that there will be no live show on Sunday, September 24th. We've got a great show this week because of some awesome No Silla Castaways. PDX Kurt will tell us about True NAS. Jill from the Northwoods will tell us more about how she uses Notion to manage her podcasts. And then we'll have an interview I did with Steve Ewell about his decision process on replacing his gas car with a planet-friendly vehicle. He's a data-driven guy, and it's a really interesting walkthrough of how he came to a very different answer than what I chose. But first, let's start with a tiny tip that's also not by me. When the new OS has come out, like everyone else, I struggled to learn all of the new features on my Mac, my iPad, my iPhone. The first thing I do is I review all of my notes of what I was so excited about at WWDC, but then I realized my notes weren't all that good, and they don't actually tell me exactly how to use the cool features that were announced. Uh, At some point, I go to apple.com, and I look for a feature list, and maybe I try a couple of things, but then I just move on. Pretty soon, I'm only using the stuff I learned in the first few days, and I never uncover all of the new tricks. But this year, I found Jacob Woolcock on Mastodon posting about his YouTube channel called iPhone Quick Tips, where he teaches tips and tricks, as you would expect from the title. What's interesting is he's put together a playlist of 45 tiny little tip videos focusing just on iOS 17 and all of the kind of more hidden features, not the big flashy stuff, but the little things. Each of these videos is no more than one to two minutes each, and they are fantastic. They're just bite size. I binge watch them over the course of a day or two, but you could watch just a couple of days so they sink in a little bit better for you. I have to tell you, I've learned so much from Jacob. The things I like is the production quality is very high and he gets right to the point immediately because he's only got one or two minutes to get the entire concept across. The videos are fun to watch because the left side is an animoji of Jacob talking and he's got this fabulous British accent. And then on the right side, he's got an iPhone demonstrating what the tip and exactly how he's doing it. He's got all kinds of fun graphics, like a little tiny hand that taps the buttons on the screen. If you want to get up to speed quickly with iOS 17 and learn all those quick little tips, I can't say enough good things about Jacob's playlist of iOS 17 tips. If I may step in for a moment, This is Allison's personal voice, created using the new accessibility feature of iOS 17. I learned how to create a personal voice in one of Jacob Woolcock's videos. I thought you might be interested in how it works. In Settings, Accessibility under the Speech section you select Personal Voice. Then you tap Create Personal Voice and begin the training. The training to create this voice required reading 150 short phrases with a pause in between each, so it took quite a bit of time. The phrases were odd in that they were about just a few things. They seemed to fall into a few categories. There were a lot about government institutions with sentences like, he was in the U.S. Senate for 12 years. The questions seemed to be obsessed with pronunciation of years. For example, they'd have me say, this happened in the 1970s. Finally, the creators were obviously hungry because there were many phrases about snacks. You'll notice that this voice sounds very deadpan. I think that's because most of the sentences were quite dull. There were very few phrases that were excited, like that puppy is so cute. When I was done recording the phrases, the phone told me to leave it alone and on a charger while it did the math to create the dulcet tones you hear now. I don't know how long it would have taken but I let it work overnight and it was ready when I woke up. In order to actually use the personal voice, you need to enable live speech in the same section of accessibility. Finally, triple-click the side button on iPhone, select live speech, and type into the field that pops up, and it will speak what you've entered. I hope you've enjoyed learning about personal voice from iOS 17. Well, I'm not sure that's going to replace my voice anytime soon, and it's not quite as good as the 11 Labs voice I used when I lost my voice back in show number 930. But considering this was all done on device, it's pretty impressive how much it does sound like me. If you're in danger of losing your voice, it would be an awesome tool to record your voice as it is now, so you have it just in case you need it. Hi, this is PDX Kurt, bringing you an introduction to the open source operating system 
for network-attached storage systems called TrueNAS, maintained by the company iX Systems. TrueNAS manages disks and runs network applications and offers volumes over the network to client computers. It's thus similar in function to the operating system that runs on products that you might buy from Synology, for instance. The problem to be solved here is, how can I get Network Attached Storage, or NAS, for not much money using hardware that I have laying around? Like a Synology NAS, a true NAS box is usually a small computer server containing multiple spinning hard disks that sits on your network and offers self-healing, redundant storage space to your computers that connect to it. Once you install the software and set up how you want the storage organized, the volumes that your computer sees on the true NAS appear as locations in the Finder sidebar, and you can copy files to and from the NAS through the Finder in the usual drag-and-drop way. You can also set up a NAS volume to be available over the network as a time machine destination and let your Mac computer store backups on it. As Allison would put it, these are all table stakes functions for a NAS, and TrueNAS performs them capably. Configuring TrueNAS is done through your web browser by navigating to a local network address. The web interface is sensible and easy to navigate, and includes monitoring pages where you can see instantaneous graphs of things like processor load, network traffic, and other important parameters. TrueNAS can be set up to scrub your disks for errors and send you an email if it finds problems. Again, these are table stakes for being in the NAS market. The next level of access is when TrueNAS files are made available on the go at locations other than your local network. While this is definitely possible with TrueNAS, it is a bother to set up. You can either install TailScale in a virtual machine within TrueNAS for finder access on the go, or you can install NextCloud as an all-around collaboration solution that provides features like document editing, calendar, contacts, and more. I should probably mention at this point that TrueNAS comes in two flavors. The original TrueNAS is based on FreeBSD and is now called TrueNAS Core, while the newer version of TrueNAS is based on Linux and is called TrueNAS Scale. Which one should you use? Well, either product will work fine for local file sharing, but if you want to install apps such as NextCloud for document sharing or Plex for media delivery, then TrueNAS Scale is a better choice. TrueNAS Scale uses Docker containers for hassle-free app installation, while installing an app like NextCloud in TrueNAS Core is a decidedly manual command line affair. The user interface of TrueNAS Core has one button app installation solutions in the web interface, but it appears that they no longer work consistently. TrueNAS support comes in two flavors. Paid support from iX Systems, either because you bought iX Systems hardware or you bought a support contract, or free community support through the TrueNAS forum. Forum support for TrueNAS is like forum support for any other open source project, sometimes great and timely, sometimes snarky, condescending, and or slow. A lot depends on the attitude and quality of information submitted by the supplicant seeking help. iX Systems sells hardware with TrueNAS pre-installed. Unfortunately, even iX Systems' most affordable box, the TrueNAS Mini, is much more expensive than a comparable Synology product. The TrueNAS Mini starts at $1,150 versus about $819 for a 4-bay Synology box. And older Synology 2-bay NAS products start at less than $250. So, I'm not making a very strong case for TrueNAS over Synology so far, am I? A commercial TrueNAS box costs much more, the free version requires you to get support from potentially cranky volunteers, and remote access isn't built in and seamless. Why would anyone ever use TrueNAS? Well, there are reasons. For one thing, TrueNAS can be downloaded and installed for free on just about any 64-bit x86 computer released in the last 10 years. 
So that old Mac Pro or PC tower sitting in your closet could be repurposed into a useful home server just for the cost of the hard drives. The most practical host boxes are ones that have bays for multiple SATA drives and at least 8 gigabytes of RAM. But in a pinch, you can even use a Mac Mini and a couple of USB drives. Raspberry Pi and Apple Silicon owners are left out, however. TrueNAS only runs on Intel processors. The TrueNAS website has a whole forum section devoted to hardware advice for different scenarios. I'm running TrueNAS on a modest 2010 4 bay HP N40L microserver that I picked up off of Craigslist for $100. The main draw for TrueNAS, however, is probably something that few outside the sysadmin community know or appreciate. TrueNAS, like FreeBSD that it is based on, uses the ZFS file system to store all its data. I will have to defer a detailed discussion of ZFS until another time, except to say that it's well-designed, feature-complete, easy to administer down to the disk level, and obsessive about data integrity. TrueNAS does a very good job of exposing nearly all of the features of ZFS in a logical way in its graphical interface, and the context-sensitive help dialogues will help you over any humps that you encounter. At this point, you might be thinking, what's the big deal? Why get excited over a file system? Synology has a file system and supports many of the same core features like data correction and encryption. It turns out that this is actually one area where TrueNAS has a significant advantage over Synology products. While Synology offers many of the same features, it achieves these only by stacking together ButterFS and a couple of other Linux technologies in series. It's very much a don't worry your pretty little head about how we do it approach with Synology. Whereas ZFS is clean and straightforward and accessible and comprehensible from top to bottom. It's a little hard to explain, but if you're the sort of person who's detail-oriented and willing to dive into the technology, it's like finding a tool that fits your hand perfectly. So, that's the skinny on TrueNAS. Free if you want it, a bit of tinkering to get the most out of it, incredible ZFS file system under the hood. Pull an old computer out of your closet and give it a try. This is fantastic, Kurt, and I know a lot of Nocilla Castaways are just nerdy enough to want to try this out. It sounds really fun, and I really wish I had an Intel box lying around, uh, but you make a compelling argument. If you could get something for 100 bucks just to play with this, that sounds like great fun. Hi, this is Jill from the North Woods. You know how much I love getting organized, but I had a problem on my hands. I was a OneNote user, and a couple things going on there. One... I'm hoping to get away from using Office 365. Yes, I hear all the anti-Windows people cheering out there. I'm going to do it. It's just not going to happen right now. But OneNote has significant problems as a notebook. It is a free-form notebook. It is about putting everything everywhere. And so eventually the organizational structure falls down, and it's just kind of a gigantic mess. I was looking for something a little bit more structured because if I'm going to have my podcasting empire, I need to be organized about what I need to record and do. I looked at a couple of other note-taking, what they call second brain. You know, you have your first brain, which is filled with all your knowledge, but you have to put it in a second brain so that you can organize it and retrieve it. Any kind of an organizational structure will do. Tried a bunch of them. Some good ones out there. Craft was one I was really interested in for sure. But you know what? In the end, I picked Notion, and it is my new best friend. Everything in my whole life, except for things like tasks and calendar, everything else is in Notion. Just to give you an idea, I used to have Pocket, where I saved all the articles that I wanted to read later. But it was so filled with things, and there was tags and other ways I could filter it. But now that I put all those articles in Notion, I have many ways I can filter it. And not only that, I was saving articles in Pocket that I meant to do podcasts about. Now, those particular notes can be associated with the proper podcast. So I'm even more organized with these miscellaneous articles I hope to read later. I also have a situation where my best friend and I go shopping, out to eat quite a bit. 
And we're always wondering, how much money does my friend owe me? Because honestly, I just pay for most things. She ends up sending me money every once in a while. So I created a Notion database of money owing. And I also have fun places to travel, places I'd like to eat, and places I'd love to go camping. See, I just use it for everything. But what I'm going to talk today is how I organize my podcast. Because even though you might want to organize something else, I think my podcast example shows a lot of different uses and a lot of different ways to store information that might be useful to you too. When it comes to my podcasts, again, this is the one that's the most structured. In fact, I think that my podcasts are so organized, I have so many views, I might even release this template of my podcast tracker out to Notion themselves. They have a repository of templates that other people build and share with everyone. You can either set a price for them or most of them are free and you can download them, play with them a little bit, use them if you like, or not use them. In my podcast tracker, there's a few things I keep track of. I have one page that's meant to capture all my technical details. This has my tokens, my URLs, my RSS feed information, anything that has to do with the structure of the podcast. Also has some information about the website that I use to host my podcast. Then there's the graphics and media page, which keeps track of my intro, my outro, and all the different graphic images I use for my podcast. So they're all right there in case suddenly I sign up for some new service and it wants a round icon for my podcast. I created one. Now it's in this notebook, so I can always find it easily. And I also have some information anytime I get details about who's listening to my podcast, which podcasts tend to do a little bit better than the other podcasts, and I'm keeping track of it. That's all been nice. And it's fine. Again, it's a good notebook for keeping track of those things. But where this has really been successful to me is that I have one called the episode list. And in this episode list, I'm able to keep track of all the podcasts that I've recorded, what status they're in, do they need to be written, recorded, or are they done? And I don't have to pay attention to them anymore. It also has a place that I can put the quote I used, the resource material I used, so I don't accidentally review the same book twice. This helps me make sure that I am not leaning into a particular topic a lot and that I don't repeat anything that I once did. And once the podcast's been released, it has a release date so I can remember. So when I go back in my podcast and say, remember in podcast nine on August 23rd, I can actually find the link, find the topic, and talk a little bit more about when I talked about this topic in the past. Makes it very easy for me to refer to my older podcasts. Another nice list I have is ideas. So when I first started podcasting, I was afraid that I wasn't going to have enough ideas to talk about. I have a list of over 200 ideas for my Start With Small Steps podcast. If I run out of ideas, there's a bunch of ideas written there. Notion has a web clipper, which is a little bit like Pocket's web clipper, where you can take a web article and send it to Notion. And Pocket will store the article for you if you pay a premium price. With this, I can embed the whole article and so I can read it later. Whether I'm on a plane or in a hotel with terrible internet, my notes are always with me. And so if I'm thinking, hmm, that might not be a bad topic, I certainly can pull it out and use it. Then you're able to create joined table views. So I created this one view that shows all the podcasts that I have, and I called it Podcast to Record. So it just lists from each of the podcasts every episode list that the status is to record. I also have one for podcasts that I need to publish to the web and podcasts that I need to write. So again, anytime I sit down looking for some work I have to do for my podcast, my lists are right there across all of the different podcasts. So it's not just me looking at one of them. I'm looking at all of them, knowing what tasks I have next. Notion has a free tier, and so that you don't have to pay for it, but you certainly get additional features if you do pay for it. With Notion Free, you get these workplaces where you can create these little databases. I hate to call them databases because they can be a lot more simple than that. 
They could be as simple as an Excel table with items across the top and along the side, but they can also get a lot more complex where you can do all sorts of database queries and other things. So it can do a lot of things if you don't know how to do some of the advanced things. It's fine. You will get a long way with it. But if you want to do more creative things, that part is also free. You'll be able to do everything that you need. And you can invite up to 10 guests to your notebook. So again, my friend and I share that notebook so we can keep track of who owes each other money. That's all part of the free account. With the Plus subscription, that is $8 a month or 10 if you bill it every month. But that gives you the ability to do Teams, file uploads, and I can invite 100 guests to view my information that I have. I'm thinking somewhat of having some databases out there for my podcast listeners. If they want to look at some of my reference materials, thinking about doing a variety of different ways that I can help my listeners find more information about what it is I talk about, review, and how to find other authors they may be interested in reading. I'm not a fan of the subscription things, but Notion has helped me so much in organizing almost every piece of data other than the calendar and the tasks, I find it worth every dime. I probably, in the end, don't need the plus plan, but I do love supporting a company that made something so wonderful. With the plus account, too, you get 30 days to restore a history. Like if you screwed something up and you made a mess of it, you can get a restore of that for 30 days. With the free account, it is seven days. You also have the ability with the Plus account to get custom domain groups so that you can make this your homepage. There's a lot you can do. I've seen people sell coursework, training materials on their Notion page. I think that's amazing, but I haven't tried it yet. And then comes integrations. You'll be able to do various synced databases. With the free account, you get one synced database and 100 rows of data per sync. With the Plus account, you get unlimited syncing databases and 20,000 rows synced. I hope the concept of synced databases and all that doesn't scare you. You do not have to get that technical. With the free accounts, you can create dynamic links, use the public API, and both the free and the Plus support HTML, Markdown, and CSV. With Notion, there are some integrations with Slack, GitHub, Asana, Dropbox, Google Drive, Google Workspaces, If This Then That, two integrations that do automations, Make and Zapier, which sounds intriguing to me. I haven't tried them out, but I'm excited to try it, probably when I get a little bit more time this winter. So for me, keeping track of my podcasts, especially since I want to have a podcasting empire, has been so helpful to me. All right, everyone, thanks for listening. Again, this is Jill from the North Woods. You can always find me on Allison's Slack channel. I hang out there quite a bit. Or you can email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. I have to tell you that having a friend like Jill who finds cool solutions to problems you didn't even know you had is super valuable. She's been teaching me what she learns about Notion, and what I've learned from her has become invaluable. I don't do half of what she does with Notion. I'm not that organized. But she did teach me how to set up a database for the articles for each show for the NoSillaCast. Then she showed me I could view it in a calendar view so I could drag and drop articles around by date. When all these little holidays started coming up, she showed me how to create a database view that creates little cards by date. So I have little columns for every date for each show. For each article, I enter the estimated time it will take in the show, and then I can drag them around to make sure I don't end up with a two-hour show followed by a 20-minute show. Now, you're about to hear a conversation between Steve Ewell and me, and this is a nice, long, beefy conversation, and I've been sliding it around using Notion, trying to find the perfect spot where there was enough time for you to be able to listen to the whole thing. A lot of the other shows had a lot to fill up, so I had trouble getting it in the right spot, but using Notion, I was able to get it where it's just going to fit in perfectly. So thank you so much to Jill for everything she's teaching me, and you should go check out Notion. I'm still on the free plan, and it's doing everything I need so far. I talk a lot about supporting the show financially, but if you can't justify becoming a patron or making a one-time donation through PayPal, consider supporting the show by doing reviews like PDX Kurt, Jill, and Steve Ewell. It gives me the gift of time, and that's often more valuable than money. 
I like the money too, though. That does help. But if you have time to do a review, that really can be a fantastic way to give me that gift of time. I'd like to welcome to the show Steve Ewell. You've probably heard his name a bunch of times before. He is the executive director of the CTA Foundation, and he chose an environmentally correct vehicle, but he didn't choose what I chose. And I thought his process was really interesting. I know a lot of people are thinking about if they wanted to get an EV or a plug-in hybrid, what would they do? What's the decision process? So Steve Ewell, welcome to the show. Allison, I'm so thrilled to be here. I love listening to the show and uh, happy to be able to join and, you know, share a little bit of a, a different vehicle than gets uh, coverage all the time uh, necessarily. So glad to be here. Well, before we go on, uh, can you give us your elevator pitch? What is the CTA Foundation? So, yeah, so the CTA Foundation is the charitable foundation that's affiliated with the Consumer Technology Association, probably best known uh, to your audience uh, for the group that runs CES. But our foundation focuses on using technology to help older adults and people with disabilities. So we fund uh, nonprofits all over the country and run several programs uh, looking at spreading the innovation and using technology to, to make a, a good impact. So thrilled to be here. Uh, but, you know, as far as we don't endorse any specific products. So uh, as we're talking uh, today, uh, I'm I'm just talking about what selection I made, uh, not necessarily saying anything good or bad about others. Okay. So this is just Steve talking. This is not just the CTA Steve. Foundation talking. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, cool. So uh, you got to start with the problem to be solved, maybe some sort of requirements list. What were you looking for in replacing your vehicle? Yeah, so I had, you know, I'm someone who tends to drive cars into the ground. So I had a, you know, 2012 Toyota Camry, which I was using a hybrid Camry, almost 200,000 miles. And it was running wow. fine, but I was you know, ready to start looking at, you know, where, where I wanted to go from here and uh, looking at new vehicles. And especially as I listened to you and as I listened to uh, Bodie and, and others talking about the, the great uh, vehicles out there, I was like, I think I'm, I may be ready to look at an EV or, or a plug-in EV or, you know, look at going kind of that direction. So by the way, the most environmentally sound thing you can do, I understand, is run your car into the ground. Right. Because it doesn't have to be built. And the building of these vehicles actually uses a lot of energy and natural resources. So you're already doing the right thing. You started with a hybrid that long ago is impressive and driving it into the ground. Both both good metrics. And and real quickly, everybody, Bodhi, he's talking about his Bodhi Grimm of the Kilowatt podcast, which is a fantastic EV podcast you should listen to. I completely endorse that as well, and uh, I'm a proud uh, Patreon supporter of both the Nozilla cast and the Kilowatt cast. So really, uh, that's been helpful just to hear the the experiences uh, that you know each of you have had your Teslas now, but also Chris Ashby with his Ford F-150 uh, Lightning and others, just the, the various vehicles that have been covered. Yeah, Steve and I kind of had monovision only about Teslas until we started listening to Bodhi and now learning about all of the different vehicles out there. It's it's really good to understand there's a lot of options, more and more every day. It, it is amazing to see what is out there. So, but yeah, I needed a, a vehicle, you know, driving into the office for me. Uh, I, I live a bit outside, you know, the, the city uh, here. So uh, I'm about 33 miles you know, from where I live into the office uh, each way. Perfect. Typical commute distance, right? They always say 30 to 40 miles. That's typical. I exactly. Uh, only with Northern Virginia traffic, that's like a, an hour, hour and a half drive. But you know, you're in Southern California, so that probably doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> to you. But uh, so I need something that could be kind of fuel efficient to uh, get me back and forth. I need something as well. My wife and I have a farm that uh, she basically runs and uh, we have a cidery there. And so I also mm. needed something that I could kind of pack with a bunch of stuff and, and bring out to the farm and move stuff around. And, you know, jamming all that into my Camry was a little bit of a challenge. So I wanted <laughs> mulch in the back seat. It, well, yeah, you, you joke, but there was a lot of times there was mulch in the back seat and, uh, <laughs> you know, all kinds of other stuff. So um, I need something that I could uh, really kind of pack with things. I didn't necessarily like I was looking at pickup trucks as well, but I at least needed something with a bit more uh, storage than what I had. You know, I was looking at as far as, you know, we do take a few road trips a year. I have family kind of up and down the East Coast. So being able to to drive and visit them uh, on longer trips. We also tend to like to go out and visit some of these uh, Virginia wineries around here. And mm. they don't tend to be in the areas that have a big 
you know, charger network. So uh, we were looking at different options as far as making sure that we can get out, but also get back uh, after uh, <laughs> that. And I'm not quite ready to fully go self-driving, trusting that to get me home after uh, a winery or two. Uh, we're getting there. <laughs> Oh, I cannot wait for that day. I, I think, honestly, just from an accessibility standpoint, self-driving is going to be an amazing uh, innovation. Right. That's the dream. That is the dream. Because, you know, if we live long enough, we will all need it. Absolutely. So, yeah. No, I think there's some some exciting opportunities there and, and looking at some of these vehicles. And then, obviously, I want something reliable. I didn't want something that was going to be in the shop all the time. So, look, did a lot of digging into that kind of data. Um, you know, I have a garage on our house that's not the biggest garage out there. Honestly, my Camry just kind of fit. So I also wanted something, you know, I have several neighbors who just kind of park in their driveway, which I could do, but I really was hoping to get a, a vehicle that would fit in the garage, be able to uh, mm -hmm. keep it you know, safe that way. What kind of price point were you looking at? I was hoping to keep it under 60000 uh, That was kind of my my goal. Okay. You know, and ideally less than that. But, uh, and I did have, you know, I had the trade-in, but it, I knew it was kind of an older trade-in with a lot of miles. So I wasn't expecting a whole lot there. So really just looking at, you know, what I could get for, for a decent price uh, while meeting a lot of these different criteria. Okay. So a lot of, you know, Silicastaways are rabid about their car has to have CarPlay. Are you in that camp? I was interested in CarPlay. I at least wanted something similar to that. You know, with my old Camry, it had uh, a system that didn't always work all that well. So I made it work, but you know, I wanted to, to try that out. Now I had tried CarPlay in a number of rental cars and a lot of them had these little tiny screens that they put CarPlay on. Yeah. So I, 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 I was kind of like, I don't know that that is going to win me over, but I wanted something that I could easily connect my phone into. Uh, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts as I'm commuting. Of course, I'm listening to your podcasts as I'm commuting uh, back and forth. <laughs> so I wanted to have something that was easy to just control that. And that way, honestly, I always had to kind of like fiddle with my phone uh, to control it, my old car. And I would prefer not to be touching my phone while I'm driving. So having something that projected it up on the, the dashboard was uh, something that wasn't an absolute requirement, but it was kind of up there on my list. Well, I think CarPlay actually is good. I've gone from it's meh to it's good. It's not great, but I th still, do still think it's good. But I think a lot of people's opinions on this are formed by the fact that the old systems we had were so bad. So they went from that to a CarPlay and not realizing there can be things that are also good, maybe not the same good as CarPlay, but you get in your head that like the, everything else must be like the car I used to have. And that's not necessarily yep. true. But anyway, so now you didn't narrow it down between EVs and plug-in hybrids, Originally, right? I was pretty convinced I was going to get an EV. I had, you know, kind of... Okay in my head that I was going to get an EV. I do have a colleague who has the Audi uh, Q4 plug-in uh, and re she really loves mm. it. So I was like, all right, I need to take a look at that. So I had... Open the door to I, that. As I was doing research, I had plugins in mind, but at the time it was more of, oh, I guess that's something I should look at. But I was pretty convinced I was going to go the EV route just based on every everything that I had read before I had actually done any real research on this yet. Okay. Now, when you talk about reliability, one of the things I wonder is, my, my father was a big proponent of, he would always say, well, that's just another thing to go wrong, like, you know, electric windows. But, you know, he's right. Every time you add complexity, you add something else. When you have a hybrid, aren't you really getting the worst of both worlds on uh, reliability? Because you have all of the components of a gas car, so you have to change the oil. You have you know you have to do all the things you do with a with a gas car, but you also have whatever could go wrong in an EV, which is sort of narrowed down some of parts. But now you've got both. You've got all the advantages of both, but you also have the reliability, right? That is absolutely a risk. Yeah, I agree. That's one of the challenges. You know, it's something that I guess having driven a hybrid now, not uh, a plug-in hybrid, for the last you know ten, eleven years, and I had. Very, I really had no issues with the hybrid system. Obviously, that's a N of one as far as uh, the the case, but uh, you know that made me a little more comfortable uh, going that route. But yeah, it is something that there there's potential challenges there, and I'm I'm recognizing that going into this. Okay, so now when Steve says he did research, 
I I actually thought you you were Bruce used the data because he is such a data nerd. When I was I kept getting the two of you confused getting ready for this, and because when I looked at your spreadsheet, it, it's how many lines long? It's like 150 lines long, and it goes to like B N I think in columns on the right. So it is a massive spreadsheet of vehicles. Uh, Bart has a, a spreadsheet as well. But it is nothing like the the uh, banana spreadsheet you created. You look well, at least of online. Cars. I wanted. I basically went through you know as many websites as I could online of what are the top you know electric or plug in vehicles out there. But I also just kind of pulled who are the major manufacturers that you can get here in the U.S. and just went to their sites and mm-hmm. looked at you know uh, was there anything that even remotely appealed to me now. There were several uh, on on my list that put on there. I did a little research, but I knew the minute I saw the price tag that uh, yeah, I wasn't going to get anywhere close to uh, you know being able to afford uh, <laughs> one of these vehicles. Highlight this row in red if above this number. <laughs> I'm big on color coding everything, so I had managed to like put in pricing both for the starting price as well as kind of I'd go in and build on their website what my ideal car would be. And then if it's over 60, it would be in red. If it was between 40 and 60, it was kind of a blue. And if it was under uh, 40, uh, it would be uh, in green. So I could just kind of easily see, you know, okay, stop looking at that. I know it's really pretty. I know it looks like it has everything I'd possibly want, (laughs) but it also is twice the price. And I think I would be in a lot of trouble if I came home with a $100,000 car. So... (laughs) There would be words. So we're going to go through line by line every single vehicle. Absolutely. I'm then. happy to put your audience to sleep. So, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, not to, not to put you on the spot, but would you be willing to share that publicly? I think so. I'm, uh, let me take one quick look at it again, just to make sure there's nothing uh, too personal or anything in there that okay. I don't think there is. But I mean, it's mostly, it's mostly links. I did research into, you know, all the various review websites and their ratings. Um, I started to populate a bunch of the different features. I didn't end up doing that for everything because honestly, I just lost right. attention span and realized I was going to see a bunch of these cars <laughs> in person. And a lot of things like like Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and all those, it's pretty much universal now. Not everyone has it, but um, I was finding, you know, as I was... It wasn't a differentiator. No, it was just kind of the, you know, if they didn't okay. have it, they had something similar that would work uh, similar, uh, work similarly. So Okay. So let me tell the audience, if you see that I have linked to the spreadsheet in the blog post, then he said yes. <laughs> if it's not there, then the, it didn't turn out to be something he was willing to share. I, I probably, think... I would think. So you'd... You narrowed it down. What what were the cars you narrowed it down to? So yeah, I had originally narrowed it down to I was well, I wanted that F one fifty, but uh, the price tag on that kind of uh, ruled that one out. So, but I oh. really had narrowed it down to the Tesla Y, the the Genesis uh, GV sixty, and the Hyundai uh, Ioniq uh, five. I looked at the the Audi as well. And then I was going to take a look at the Kia uh, EV6. So once again, almost all of them were electric, fully electric uh, vehicles. Pure EVs. And then, you know, ultimately, as I was going around testing, actually, it was interesting. I had one dealership uh, that I went to and went to go look at their car. And the dealer talked me out of buying an electric vehicle from them because he was just like, oh, I wouldn't buy an electric vehicle these days, uh, you know just not the infrastructure. There's Mm. not like all this. And so I was like, okay, well, if you don't want to sell me the vehicle, I'm more than happy to uh, keep moving on. (laughs) I think maybe his manager got on him later because I started getting all kinds of uh, emails uh, from him asking when I was coming back in to look at vehicles. So, (laughs) but when I went to the the Kia dealership, which honestly, I, I really was just looking at the EV6 because I thought it was an interesting car. It was fairly highly rated and it didn't jump out at me when I looked at that car. But while I was there, I was like, you know, I should look at their plugins just to see what they have. That really won me over pretty quickly. The Kia Sportage is the the plug-in, well, the plug-in version of the Kia Sportage, which is kind of their midsize uh, SUV. And 
it just had the, it was a bit bigger than a lot of the the full EVs uh, that I was looking at. So it had a bit more cargo space, uh, which was something that was important to me. Just, I liked the look of it. I thought it, you know, had both the, the outside of it as well as the, the internal setup uh, worked really well for me. And it kind of matched, I mean, maybe it's because the electric range for it is right at that 33 miles, which is what I need to uh, drive into work. Now, I knew I wouldn't necessarily mm. get, you know, that means I might have to pay or do a little bit of gas to get to work. Although, amazingly enough, I've been getting to work with a little bit of charge left. So I'm guessing at some point uh, during my commute, it takes a little bit of gas or it's just getting enough from re- regenerative braking to... Uh, well, that's what I was wondering, whether you're getting regenerative braking. And it, it, I, my understanding was it uses electric getting up to speed, but or they, I should say, hybrids, plug-in hybrids do uh, electric getting the low-end torque and getting you up to speed, but it might use gas to keep going. No, it can do that. There's various settings. So I have mine Mm. pretty much set to operate as an electric vehicle until it runs out of charge and then it will move into more of that hybrid uh, model. You can set it so it works more like uh, what you're describing, where it will kind of start with, you know, electric, but then move over to to gas at at various times. So that's the other thing. Maybe it's the the techie in me that, but (laughs) this vehicle has so many settings. Like you can dive in and you know adjust the you know the color scheme inside and you know what's showing up where on the dashboard and i also liked i think mm-hmm. you had talked on one of your previous podcasts about having custom buttons this has a couple buttons on uh, in the vehicle there's one on the the steering wheel there's another kind of on the like center console area and another in the, in the kind of main display uh, that you can actually customize what those buttons do. Now, I wish it was fully customizable. Basically, for each one, you can go into a menu and choose from like eight different options for for what those uh, buttons can do. That's still pretty good. But you want it, you want it to be all of them. <laughs> oh, I, I want to be able to fully say, uh, you know, run a macro when I press this button. Uh, <laughs> probably don't want macros running on my Short, car, but uh, shortcut support. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, it's one so of those. I, I do want to tell the audience something. I keep forgetting to tell them after the most recent time that I complained about the fact that I can't use any kind of button to control uh, the temperature in my car. That I have to use the touchscreen. Uh, Tesla came out with an update that does allow you to assign a, a, one of the buttons on the steering column to change the temperature. And I think there's a couple of different things you can change it to. I don't think it's as many as eight. The sad part is because Steve and I are on the, the beta track for, for full self-driving. We haven't gotten that update yet. So Pat Dangler's got it and Bart's got it and Stefan Lesage has it. Mark Pauly has it. All these people have it and they're all excited. They're changing their temperature with a thumb wheel. And the one person who complained the most about it doesn't have it yet. <laughs> Yeah, but it's coming. That, that's the way it goes uh, when you're on that cutting edge. Right. Hey, so let's back up just a little bit. We're getting a little bit into the weeds. Describe the Kia Sportage. I've never seen it. Is it a car? Is it a truck? What is it? So it's an SUV. So uh, it's kind of the midsize SUV for Kia. It is kind of two rows of seats. So it's not, uh, it doesn't have the third mm-hmm. row, but it has a nice big you know, back area uh, as far as, you know, storage and, and cargo space. Uh, because it is a, a plug-in hybrid versus full electric, I don't have the frunk. I, I was kind of looking forward to a, a frunk, <laughs> but uh, but it's got plenty of uh, space as far as kind of a, a, in the back area. You know, as far as, you know, design of the, the vehicle, it's got, you know, it kind of has the electric, the LED, you know, front lights and back lights and everything. So it's, you cool know, looking. Uh, stands out a little bit, although you see so many cars with I know, those now. I know, that's cheating. That used to be how you could tell if something was an EV, and now it's like the, the gas cars are doing it. It's like, oh, come on. <laughs> yep, exactly. Uh, now, I, my father was asking me to uh, be able to explain, you know, how he knows uh, a Sportage that's electric versus one mm. that's not. And honestly, the only way he'd be able to tell, I think, right now is Mine has, it looks like gas entries on both sides of the vehicle because one side is the gas, one side (laughs) is the electric plug-in. Otherwise, it would only have the one. So you'd have to encircle the car to be able to tell if it's a a plug-in hybrid. To tell if it's the plug-in hybrid or not. But yeah, so yeah, it's it's your typical SUV, but uh, I... 
I like the the setup. It's pretty. I just look up the picture. Okay, so you can go the thirty three miles on electric, pretty much. Uh, what about your full range with the with gas? Have you tested that out yet? So I haven't necessarily tested it fully. I've done a couple uh, road trips. Uh, in fact, actually, that's one of the nice things is I've now had the car two months and driven about twenty four hundred mm-hmm. miles, and I've just I just put in my third tank of gas to to the nice. vehicle. So and two of those were because I took a road trip to Richmond uh, for a weekend, and so I topped it off uh, to go down there and then refilled it. Coming and home. So I think when I fill it up, it tells me if I have both a full electric charge and a full gas charge. It's got like a 450 mile range, something like that. I like how you just called it a gas charge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm moving over to the electric. Well, yeah, world. the words get hard. Like you want to say, I press the gas pedal. Well, no, it's, is it in your car? What is it? Is it, We'll call it accelerator. I, I was going to say, I think at this point it's an accelerator. But yeah, so I, I you know, it's not a big gas tank. I think they do that just from a, a weight weight issue. You said so. it had 400 mile range on gas. So yeah, it's about that. It yeah, not a big gas tank. My last gas car was 300. It's 11 point uh, one gallons. So I know when I've tried to. So fill, it's got it's good mileage because it moves into hybrid mode when it's not doing full electric. Okay. It does have you know pretty good you know miles per gallon on on the gas. So that's a big advantage. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, because that's not a very big tank at all. I think mine was fifteen gallons, and and I mean if I got three hundred miles, three twenty, that was a good a good tank. But that that yeah. was mostly around the city. So uh, whatever, what other high tech features does it have? So I mean, this one does have uh, you know all the. You know, what you'd be looking for as far as uh, it does have the Apple CarPlay in there. Mm -hmm. One of the things I do like about it, though, is it's got a really long kind of display for that. So you're able to, you know, Apple CarPlay has where you can put like multiple apps on the screen at once. So you can have your, you know, ways going for maps while having your podcast going. Um, it always seems to insist on putting whatever's next on my calendar on there, even though I don't want to know. I really wish I had more control over what shows up where uh, there. I think that's an Apple thing mm. as far as you know being able to control all that. But because it's such a big screen, it doesn't feel like it's cramped and, and little. It's really mm. easy to, to see and control everything on there. So uh, that goes really well. That's been my biggest complaint with CarPlay is is I feel like crammed all this stuff together and you've got little tiny boxes of stuff. And again, most of my experience, actually possibly all of my experience has been in rental cars. The, the one exception being yep. the Chevy Bolt had a nice big screen, which is you know crazy in a $28,000 car. So they could be doing it in the other ones. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, that was my experience before it as well. So I wasn't sure, um, you know, about going that direction, but this one really kind of won me over. It does have uh, a lot of like, you can adjust the modes of driving. So I tend to leave it in eco mode, which does give you a little better miles per gallon. But if you want to, you can go into sport mode and it's got a little more, you know, pep to it coming off the, the line and all that. It's not a Tesla at all. Uh, that was the one thing I definitely noticed I was given up by not going with the the Tesla is just the the horsepower uh, of, you know, being able to to start up when the, the light goes green. Uh, but it's it's got a decent Let amount. Let me describe that a little bit to people and have you tell me what your experience is like in the Kia. The the interesting thing about driving an EV, and most of my experience in EVs has been on on the Tesla, is that it's it's a linear torque curve. So you know how in a gas car you start to accelerate and it and it kind of goes and it, it 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 jumps up. You can tell the curve is not linear. It go it it kicks in on the electric vehicles. It's just linear. You just press on the pedal and there's a direct connection from you to going faster and the acceleration is phenomenal on it. So even if the acceleration isn't phenomenal in the mode that in modes that you're talking about, is it still that that linear feel or do you feel more like with a gas car? It depends on whether you're running electric at the time or if you're running on the gas at the oh, time. So you don't so know what you're going to get. When it's on gas, you can de- well, I mean if you know you have electric charge, you're going to okay. get the electric unless I mean you can kind of shut it off or tell it you want to run gas. The only time I would think of doing that would be if I haven't filled up my gas tank in a really long time. Uh, you need to burn now, the some. Deal, dealer said that it could probably go about six months with the, the gas in there. And supposedly the car's smart enough that it knows 
to start burning more gas uh, if you need it, to gas gets to do that. stale, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't so, understand what stale means. Do you know, is it a chemical decomposition in some way? This is over my head. I don't know. Um, I know there's, you know, various treatments you can use for it, but, you know, and evidently it's a pressurized tank and that's supposed to help prevent it from getting stale. Water vapor or anything in there. But yeah, I, you know, I kind of have it in my head that I'm going to be a little more conservative. And if I haven't filled up my gas tank in three months or so, uh, I'll probably plan to uh, go to a winery. (laughs) Exactly. Go out, have some experience. And then, uh, you know, unfortunately need to fill up the tank. But if I only have to fill up the tank quarterly, uh, I think that'll be uh, it's a win. uh, I'm happy with that. So Yeah. Now, there's another question. Somebody was just talking to me yesterday. We got a chance to see a, a Rivian, and uh, we ended up talking about all kinds of different cars. And you have to change the oil as well on your car. Is that right? I do. So but you that have to was... know to do it, even though you haven't, you haven't driven the, on, on gas very far. Yeah. So that is, you know, one of the other downsides that I was looking forward with an EV of not having much maintenance at all. Mm-hmm. But because I have the the gas engine as part of it, I do still need to do the various maintenances, change the oil, do all that. But that's important for people to remember, right? Is that oh, yeah. even if you're not using the engine very much. So I assume that you would not need to change the oil very often because usually it's because you get little shavings of metal as the gears are hitting each other and stuff that affects the uh, quality of the oil. But my understanding is just it's sitting in there for a long time. You need to change it, too. Yeah. So usually they, based on time, they also, I mean, and how often they want you to do it versus how often you absolutely need to do it. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not a mechanic. I won't, you know, say for sure, but but yeah, you still need to, even if you're pretty much only running an electric, my sense is you still need to change the oil every so often. Yeah. My father-in-law really instilled in Steve and me that you really want to change the oil as often as they say, like they say every 3000 miles, we used to do it every 3000 miles and that you just, if you want your car to last a lot longer, it's a good idea to actually do, you know, it's it's not like how often they tell you to floss at the dentist or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> so back to electronics, what about cameras and things like that? So yeah, it's got the surround sound cameras. Now this was or surround, no, surround sound, sound. <laughs> <laughs> the surround cameras, the 360 cameras. And this is something my wife had in her car. And I really kind of fell in love with that and said, you know, that was something that was high on my list to get because just pulling into a, and I don't know, it's one of those things I've been driving for many, many years now and uh, never needed it. But once you have it, it just, it's so nice to see, oh yeah, I'm well within the lines and, you know, not, you know, have plenty of space behind me. I'm not sticking out of the spa- spot at all. More cameras is safer, yep. right? More views. Oh, absolutely. Fewer blind spots. So, yeah. So it, it uh, I really like that feature. Um, it also has all like so many of the different like safety sensors of like, if you go to try to back out and someone's coming down the the parking row, it'll beep at you and stop you. And uh, okay. same if you were pulling forward, watches for pedestrians, it will yell at me if I'm, you know, moving out of the lane the, the wrong way and and all that kind of stuff. So it's got a lot of those kind of safety features uh, built into it. Uh, I feel like so that... The, the little kid on a tricycle is going to live. Yeah, I, I really hope so. He's backing up. <laughs> right. What about uh, driving on the highway, automatic cruise control, any adaptive cruise control, that kind of thing? Yeah. So it does have, it's got the automated uh, lane assist, so it'll keep the car within the lane even as the okay. road is. That actually... Uh, you know, dr- driving home from when I picked up the the car, I ended up picking it up from a place that was a couple hours away. So I was playing with that the whole, it now it yells at you if you try to take your hands off the wheel uh, as you're doing that. But it was amazing how well on some fairly windy roads, it was sticking right to the the lanes. It also has its highway drive assist, which basically takes that lane assist and then adds kind of the adaptive cruise control to it. So, you know, it will adapt to what the car in front of you is uh, doing to keep a a proper space there. I wouldn't say it's, um, you know, like Tesla's uh, self-driving at this point. That's most of the features that we use, though. To be honest, is the staying in the lane and the adaptive cruise control. Now, in our cars, if you're in true stop and go traffic, it'll come all the way at a stop and actually accelerate back up as uh, cars start to move. Does yours do that? 
It has something like that. I, I think it, depending on how long you're stopped at some point, if you're stopped for too long, I think it kicks out of that mode. Oh. Honestly, I haven't really experimented with that all that much. There's so much construction going on on our roads right now as I'm driving <laughs> into work that I'm still not convinced I fully trust it around all the you know right. orange cones and everything. So I'm usually maintaining control as I'm I'm doing that. But I know there there is some features there, but I don't want to say for sure how well or it, well it doesn't work. Okay. Okay. What about uh, any kind of remote control? So, yeah, that was something that, you know, well, there's a couple different things there. One, um, the guy that was selling me the car kept highlighting, you know, with the app, you can remote control this uh, vehicle and you can turn it on. Even if you're like at an amusement park and it's way out in the the you know parking lot, you can turn on the vehicle, get it started. I was like, I don't know that I want to do that, but I guess there's well, a use. Maybe case. you want it to not be 2000 degrees when you get inside. That That is true. So, uh, but so it does have that, but uh, then it has with the key fob, you can actually back up or pull forward the the vehicle. So basically, if you're in a really tight parking spot, you can get it to kind of pull out for you. You can get in and then drive off. I've experimented with this kind of at home in my garage and and driveway. I haven't quite pulled the trigger on trying that in the (laughs) real world yet, uh, mostly because there was one, actually, we were out at a a concert and I was looking at doing this, but the line of cars trying to get down uh, was so long. I didn't want to be there trying to play with this and get it working, uh, you know, blocking traffic. So uh, I haven't really tried it out in, uh, in, in the wild yet. But I've only door. tried that twice in my car, and it was because I had to, because some bozo parked, you know, a sixteenth of an inch from the driver's side, and I just pulled my car out. Interestingly enough, I've tried to do it in my own garage, and it's I have a lot of trouble with it, and I think it's because of the cellular signal confused with the Wi-Fi signal because the car's still inside my, my garage, and so it's hit or miss whether it works. But the, both of the times I actually needed to get it out, it was there for me. So that was that was good to have, I think. Yeah, it seems like it's a nice feature. So yeah, I've I've liked that. I'll tell you one other feature I really love about the car, the cooled seat. So I'd had heated <laughs> seats before, but I had never mm-hmm. tried cooled seats, the ventilated seats. That is, I mean, it gets hot and humid here in Virginia. And I that feature alone, I think, stands out to me. It seems like it's That's very funny. basic, but I love it. My son just got a Honda, which is, what is their minivan called? Odyssey. And it has cooled seats and he lives in, in Houston. He is a fan. Oh, I would imagine. Fans. <laughs> <laughs> fans on your fanny. Yep. So we've been talking all great things. What There's got to be some downsides to the car. Yeah. Let's balance it out a little. I mean, certainly there's things that, you know, are, are kind of little pains uh, about the, the vehicle. You know, I'll tell you one thing that, like I said, I ended up going a couple hours away to pick up the car because there's actually not a lot of them available. I ended up using their website mm-hmm. to look and basically pull up every car from New Jersey down to North Carolina to find, you know, who had them. When I showed up to get this car, I didn't realize it was this matte paint, which I've seen a bunch of cars on the road with this matte mm-hmm. paint. Uh, and I was like, okay, fine. It looks okay. I'm I'm good with it. But then they make you sign a whole nother document saying how to take care of matte paint. And you can't go to a car wash to wash your car. You need to get special soap really? and microfiber and whatever else. And here I am thinking every weekend I'm driving out to a farm on a dirt road. So we'll yeah. see how long this paint lasts. I don't know, but wow, uh, that I'd, know. I'd never even heard of this. Yeah. So I, huh. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I don't mind the look of it, but they made don't me think delicate paint. Uh, I was going to say, I, I, if anything, I want uh, more hardy paint, not uh, more delicate paint. But so that's one kind of a little annoyance. Um, it did come with the tire mobility kit, basically a patch system instead of a spare. Is it that goo that squirts on the yeah. inside of the tire? Yeah, exactly. And it seems like from from doing my research, a lot of EVs and, and plug-ins are going that route just because it reduces weight in the car. Yeah. Well, you're one step ahead of the Tesla. We didn't get a spare tire and we didn't get a tire mobility kit. We had to buy that separately for another $200. So, yeah, uh, you know, we only paid 70 grand for the car. Why would we get something like that for free? <laughs> well, when I test drove the Tesla and asked about that, they basically said, well, you know, you're just going to call and someone will eventually show up. And I was like, OK, so, you know, if I have a flat tire, I can't just get on the way myself. But yeah, so that. 
you know, at least I guess I do have the kit to to patch, but uh, that is something that, you know, if I had my way, I would have still had the, the spare. Yeah. You yeah. know, one thing, and once again, this is in, I think, all EVs now, but when you back up, it's got the, the backup beeper, mm-hmm. which from working in accessibility, I'm fully on board with. Uh, I don't want, you know, I don't want anyone to walk out and back at me, even if my car should know to stop. I will say, you know, 6 a.m. in the morning when I'm backing out of my garage and wondering how my neighbors feel about my, (laughs) you know, backing up truck, not quite that loud, but that is something that I'm always a little self-conscious of. I feel like I'm the big Mack truck uh, backing up in the the morning. (laughs) uh, What's charging like? Charging, that's probably the one other area is it only does level one and level two charging. So, so not to and DC fast charge. Yep. So it doesn't, it does, do, DC fast it doesn't do the DC fast, or at least I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. I don't have a connector mm-hmm. for that. There may be some kind of adapter, but I haven't figured that out if it does. But you know, level one charging is even though it's you know much smaller battery than uh, uh, a full EV, it's still pretty much charging overnight. So that's when you say level one, that's just off the 110? Plug it into a 110. And, you know, actually, when I first got it, it it comes with a level one charger. And the charger, you can actually adjust the, the wattage on it. And I didn't realize that at first. So I plugged it in and ran it for about 24 hours and it hadn't fully charged because it was down on this like really low trickle charge level that basically just kind of, I guess, keeps the battery um, slowly charging. But, you know, once I realized that and adjusted the setting, um, you know, it basically is, I think, like six or eight hours. It's overnight to to charge that way. Now, I have... Do Do you know what your battery capacity is? That's a good question. I know I've seen that and I'm it's, not remembering. It's probably in your spreadsheet, right? Uh, it's probably somewhere. Yeah. Um, I'm not remembering it off the top of my head. Now, level two charger, we have one of those at my office and I'm looking at installing one. So level two one. charger is like uh, 220. Yeah. And maybe 40 amps. Yeah. Something like that. And that it'll charge fully in, you know, probably about two hours. I think it averages about two hours. So, you know, once again, it's not something where I can just like stop on the side of the road and and charge unless I'm doing kind of a longer stop somewhere. So like when I took the road trip down to to Richmond, you know, the hotel we were staying at had a, a charger. So I plugged it in there and was able to, to charge uh, fairly quickly there. But it's not, I mean, as much as people talk about being able to charge on a road trip, it's a little bit long, even if I find level two chargers to you know, have to stop two hours each time to to charge it. And then that's the other thing I realized about the plug-in hybrids, because at first I was a little worried of, I've been fully charging this vehicle. And you know, I know with EVs, you don't necessarily want to fully charge it all the time. Turns out the way the plug-in hybrids tend to work is the battery actually has more capacity than what they're necessarily showing you. So when you're fully charging it, it's actually at that about 80% level, at least according to what I've read online. Okay, well, that's that's better to to trick you in that way because it, it turns out it's bad for batteries to be charged to 100%. That's a, yeah. a thing. So we do it before we go on a long road trip, but the rest of the time it, we keep it set at 80. Yeah, so essentially when I think I'm fully charging the vehicle, it it still has potentially some capacity. I just don't have access to that uh, right. additional. But still, capacity. level two in two hours, that, that, that is a little, that's got to be a little bitty battery because battery, ours takes a lot longer at level two. So the DC fast charging is definitely a better deal. Yeah. Well, it sounds like this is a this is a really nice car, a really nice alternative. It gives you the size that you were looking for with all the, the storage. You've got the advantages of being able to drive to work without using any gas, but you can on the spur of a moment decide, okay, we're going to go to a vineyard and you've got the range with the gas assist in that case, right? Absolutely. So yeah, this is, uh, I've been very happy with this vehicle so far. So, Oh, and how much did uh, it cost? Oh, did it uh, need the 60K? It, it, no, it was 43. 43? So 43. Wow. And that was, I think, before, you know, trade-in and all that kind of stuff. 43 out the door or is that before tip and tax? So that's before tip and tax. And I think actually, ultimately, it ended up being about 43, uh, you know, once I got my trade in uh, taken off but then all the the tax and all that stuff added on one mm-hmm. thing i will say if anyone's looking at, and i don't know if this is just kia's or if other i assume other dealers do this as well but the first dealership i went to to buy 
uh, from, they had what they called a market adjustment fee. Uh, basically, there's a mm -hmm. lot of demand for electric vehicles in Northern Virginia. And so they actually wanted an extra $10,000 for the car. Oh. And so I was like, I'm, I'm not paying $10,000. And they were not willing to negotiate uh, on that. But what I found is every dealership sets their own fee. So there was mm -hmm. one other I went to nearby and they were at like, I think it was like $3,500 for their uh, adjustment fee, which was better. But when I went up to Pennsylvania to buy the car, I learned that you know when you go to an area where basically the dealer even told me he can't sell an EV where he is. Oh. <laughs> they had no market adjustment fee. He was, you know, happy to, oh, you know, get it off the the lot, I think. Um, so, you know, that was an wow. interesting kind of lesson learned as I, you know, shopped yeah. around a little bit uh for for the vehicle. No, I learned from uh, Chris Ashley when the Ford F150 first came out, a bunch of uh dealers were starting to tack on 10, 20,000 dollar fees and Ford came down and slapped them and yeah. said, "No, you're not." Yeah, and I, I mean, thought that was really interesting. I, th that impressed me that Ford said no. I mean, I would imagine for the vehicle manufacturer, I mean, that's suddenly all these vehicles, you know, if they get the reputation for being too expensive and it's all because of these extra fees added on, uh, that's not good yeah. for them. So Right, uh, right. And, and of course, they don't get any of that extra market adjustment fee. <laughs> but I think what they did was they said, okay, fine, you can do that, but you aren't getting another one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that'll be the only one you ever sell. So yeah. not a good deal. Well, this has been very cool. Well, uh, you've got a, a pretty good write-up on this that we're going to uh, publish as well. And uh, it sounds like a lot of fun. I think this is cool. I like learning about all the different alternatives because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very brand loyal. Once I, I'm, yeah, the chances of me changing out of Tesla, well, given certain circumstances, possibly, but I tend to buy one kind of thing and then I just stick with it forever. I only ever owned Hondas and Acuras before this car. So uh, well, I, I like learning about things that I don't know anything about. This was very cool. Yeah, well, happy to share, uh, you know, share a little bit of an alternative here. And uh, yeah, I mean, there were, like I said, it came down to me between the, the Kia and the Tesla were my final two. And I think I would have been very happy either direction. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately, I think I, I found the car that was the right fit for me. Very cool. Now, if anybody wants to chat with Steve more about this or anything else, he's pretty active in our Slack community over at podfeet.com slash Slack. That's perfect. I was going to say, I'm not as active on the various socials any anymore, but yeah, Slack is a great place to find me. I had so much fun doing that recording with Steve. And yes, he did give us the spreadsheet. It's linked in the blog post that's linked in the show notes. That is going to wind us up for this week. Did you know you can email me at allison at podfeed.com anytime you like? If you have questions or a suggestion or a review, just send it on over. You can follow me on Mastodon at podfeed at chaos.social. Remember, everything good starts with podfeed.com. If you want to join in the fun of the conversation, you can join our Slack community like we just said at podfeet.com slash slack, where you can talk to me and all of the other lovely no silly castaways, including Steve Ewell. You can support the show at podfeet.com slash Patreon or with a one-time donation at podfeet.com slash PayPal. And if you want to join in the fun of the live show, not this week, but normally you can head on over to podfeet.com slash live on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific time and join the friendly and enthusiastic no silly castaways. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.